would you say, since there have been changes that you've been, and I don't want to put any more on your plate than you already have, but some sort of a pioneer in that area as far as bringing to light the uh, possible impact that, that online academia can, can have? Uh, you know, I, you always hesitate to use a word like pioneer about your work. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's the case. I know that we've, um, I do think we've done some pioneering work on film noir. I think that we've achieved some new insights um, that were important to achieve, and I, I don't think that the mechanism has been negligible in that. Uh, to have a forum like we had necessarily leads you to some different sorts of discussions, and that was part of the, the importance of it, too. We didn't want to engage in scholarship that was um, you know, really one voice using traditional established critical paradigms to discuss these, discuss these things. We wanted to do something that was fundamentally dynamic and led to some unexpected insights because the, the nature of an exchange like that is not controllable like the nature of a, a personally authored article. So I do think that um, you know, hopefully we've made some important contributions there. We, we continue to try to find mechanisms that we think are viable mechanisms that, that academia should consider. So maybe that's you know, sort of cutting edge. There are, there are journals like the Shakespeare Quarterly that have tried um, some open peer review um, mechanisms, um, but this combination of open access and open peer review is, is novel because then anyone can leave um, feedback. Sure. Um, you don't have to be a registered person with the journal in order to leave the, the peer review. Anyone can leave the peer review. So that's going to be an interesting mechanism that I think will have a democratizing effect, hopefully, on uh, the way that um, the review of academic work is conducted. And hopefully it sort of reinvigorates the whole tradition of public intellectualism where the public public has a real stake in it. The, um, the academic is interested in reaching a large audience, not because they're trying to be populist, but just because they want to have this discussion with as many people as they can. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a democratic impulse that's important. So then let's talk about uh, what is in the book. It's, it's <laughs> not just a transcript. It grew out of the, out of the podcast, but it wasn't just right. a transcript of the podcast. No. It was. It, it, was, it was many things, I guess, initially. Part of it was that we felt that um, film studies, scholarship around film noir was tending to do one of a couple of things. There's a, a long-standing divide between film historians and film theorists around noir. And um, I think that both approaches have their merits, and both, both approaches have led to really important insights about noir. The problem for us was that neither approach was producing new information at this point. Um, that they were that these studies were starting to to go down fairly expected paths, and you were sort of understanding before you read the article what sort of article you were going to get. And we thought that both camps had their strengths, and that there might be ways to find a middle ground that was um, that could lead to some new insights. It was really about finding new information about the style, because noir is an incredibly dynamic style that was really challenging to to the world in a way, and certainly to the film world in the post-war years. And to talk about it in static ways seemed like a disservice. So we wanted to borrow from the film historians this call to return to the films themselves. Um, and we wanted to borrow from the theorists this idea that noir uh, does some innovative and critically challenging things. And we wanted to find a way to split the difference where we were returning to the films but not naively and we were embracing theoretical approaches but not to the to the extent that we forgot about the object of study so what we ended up arguing was that uh, film noir is an incredibly self-conscious style and i think anybody who's a real fan of noir knows that there's something of a noir narrative template that noir seem to always be aware of what they're doing as they tell noir stories. And there's, it, things are often told with a wink and a nudge. And it's not because they're being sarcastic or glib. It's because they're very, very aware of the way they're constructing a story. So 
With that, we said, let's return to the films, but look for those moments that seem to be stating something about what it is they're doing. And that often means um, you know, tribute shots, where one film stages a tribute to another film. There's a great example in Asphalt Jungle, when the, the lawyer Imrich um, shows up at the top of the staircase at the balcony and then descends the stairs to find the police at the bottom, which is such a conscious tribute to the great shot in Double Indemnity when it's Barbara Stanwyck up on the balcony who descends to find Fred McMurray. And the entire power structure has been reversed, where it was a female who had this seductive while, it's now a male, where it was the woman who was in control, it's now this male who who's, has no control of the situation. These are, but the, the framing of those shots is virtually identical. So when you see shots that are tribute tribute shots, you understand that noir is staging, it's borrowing in order to stage some sort of self-conscious reference. And so we started looking at these self-conscious moments and saying, what do they tell us about noir itself? And that was sort of the impetus behind the project, was what can, you know, how is it that, in, in critical terms, that um, particular types of self-consciousness create what scholars would call autoexegesis, self-critical reading. And uh, so we looked at those moments. And what we found was, in fact, that some of the most iconic moments in film noir are the most self-conscious moments, which would, again, lead you to believe that it is a highly self-conscious film style. Part of that, too, was that as we started to look at noir, the, the noir historians who claim you just have to return to the films to understand what film noir is and you don't need a theoretical apparatus, strangely end up not returning to the films. They end up returning to, to uh, publicity shots a lot of times, which are highly stylized, like the films themselves, but much simpler. Um, if you look at like Silver and Orsini's book, um, Noir Style, you'll see that a lot of those are actually studio publicity shots. And they're much more static, much less dynamic, and much less quirky than noir itself. So as we started looking at these moments, and we, we did look for the moments first and foremost that we thought were self-conscious and self-referential in ways that revealed something about the way that noir films wanted to be read. But what we ended up discovering was that the really telling moments in noir aren't just somebody holding the Maltese Falcon. They're the, they're the poodle on the tarmac uh, <laughs> in The Killing. They're, uh, you know, Sterling Hayden falling to his knees at the end of Asphalt Jungle in, in the, uh, you know, the horse pasture Kentucky. in Kentucky. You know, there, there are these really quirky, quirky moments uh, in noir that are incredibly important moments that people rarely talk about because if you do, it, it, the discussion gets messy. Unless you understand that noir is a self-conscious style, you almost have to excise those moments in order to, uh, to just see it as this really clean style that is high contrast, low key lighting, um, and, and the sorts of stylistic cues that people talk about with noir.